Hey AP, in this video we are going to talk about enthalpy and entropy. So enthalpy is something that we have talked about before, which is our delta H. So enthalpy is we call delta H of something, and entropy is something new. Entropy is shown by a delta S. So let's take a minute to refresh our brains about enthalpy, and then we'll get into entropy and how that's different. So enthalpy, we've talked about, is how a system looks at the energy flow. And usually the energy flow is in heat. So we say that the change in enthalpy of a reaction is equal to Q, or the heat of our reaction, and that's at a constant pressure. For a reaction at a constant pressure, our delta H, or our change in enthalpy for the reaction, is equal to the heat or our enthalpy of our products minus the enthalpy of our reactants. And that is one of the formulas on our reference guide. We see that one here. Okay, so again, we're in this thermochem and electrochem section of our reference guide. And we know that if our delta H is positive, we have an endothermic reaction, that means heat is a reactant. And if delta H is negative, we have an exothermic reaction or heat is a product. There were three quantitative relationships between chemical equations and delta H's. So remember that if a chemical equation is multiplied by some integer, we also multiply our delta H by that same integer. So if we have this reaction here, 3A plus B makes 2C, and it has a delta H value. And let's say in order to make it work for one of our elementary steps, we have to multiply all of our coefficients by 2. That means that we also multiply our delta H by 2. So we have 6A plus 2B makes 4C, and that our delta H is twice that. And that's because the delta H is based on the moles of our original reaction. The other thing that we can do is if we reverse a chemical reaction, then we change the sign of our delta H. So here we have A plus B makes C plus D, which gives us a positive delta H. And now if we flip our reaction around or we reverse it, now we have a negative delta H. Lastly, we can use Hess's law, which talks about how the enthalpy of a reaction is the sum of the elementary steps of that reaction, where we use these first two to manipulate those elementary steps, add them together to get our total heat of reaction or enthalpy of our reaction. So let's take a look at this example here. They should be long arrows. So I want to get to the reaction of Carbon plus hydrogen makes C3H8, which I believe is propane. So we have these different elementary steps, and I want to make this one. So I want my C3H8 to be on the right, and right now I've got it on the left. So this reaction I'm going to need to reverse. So I'm going to have 3 CO2, 4 H2O. C3H8, 5O2, and if I've reversed it, that means now my delta H is the opposite of this, so negative 2043 kilojoules. I need to have three carbons on the left, and this one only has one, so I'm going to multiply this reaction times three. So I'm going to have three carbons, and that distributes three oxygens three carbon dioxides. So my delta H for that one is three times negative 393.5 kilojoules. And I need to have four oxygens. Right now I have, or sorry, hydrogens. And right now I only have two. So that means this reaction needs to get multiplied by two. So I'm going to have two oxygens, four hydrogens, me four waters. So my delta H for this one is two times negative 43.6 kilojoules. And now I add all these together, cross off things that are the same on the left and the right. So three carbon dioxides, three carbon dioxides, those cancel out. Four waters and four waters, those cancel out. I've got three carbons and that doesn't seem to cancel, so three carbons. I've got two and three oxygens, which is five, but five oxygens over here. So those cancel out. 
I've got four hydrogens. Those will cancel out. And on the right, I've got C3H8. So I double check, and that's the reaction that I was going for. So that's good. So now when I add all of these together, I get my total heat of the reaction to be negative 4, 1, and 0, 0.7. And that's kilojoules per mole of my reaction. Okay. So, so far, review, right? This is one of our types of ways in which we can describe our chemical reaction thermodynamically. Something that we haven't talked a lot about or we just mentioned it a few times, is this idea of having standard states. And a standard state is an arbitrary set of conditions for calculating these thermodynamic state properties of delta H, delta E, delta G. So this is the, um, has to do with cell potential or the energy or electrochemistry in our reaction. So for compounds, their standard state for a gas is at one atmosphere of pressure. The standard state for a solution is at one molarity. And for liquids and solids, they're considered pure, and then we look at them at one atmosphere as well. If we're looking at an element, we're looking at it at one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius. And it's important not to confuse the standard state with standard temperature and pressure of gases, um, because remember, standard temperature and pressure of gases, it is one atmosphere, but it's 273 Kelvin as well. So that is specific for gases as a standard temperature and pressure that's not the standard state of a gas. Um, for a standard enthalpy of formation, that means that we are going to have the little symbol, so we we'll have delta H F, and then we have this little symbol, this little not symbol at the top, and that tells us that it's the standard enthalpy. Okay, And this is the enthalpy when one mole of a compound forms from its elements in their standard states. So if you're a pure element in its standard state, the delta H F is zero. And that's just because it cancels out. Okay, Remember, this degree indicates a standard state. So if I am looking to write the equation for the formation of magnesium carbonate and C6H12O6, which I believe is glucose, from their elements in their standard states. So two different reactions. So for magnesium carbonate, my standard states of magnesium is magnesium solid. Then I have carbon. Carbon is also a solid. And oxygen is a diatomic, so it's O2, and that's a gas. And those are going to all come together to make our magnesium carbonate solid. We want to balance this. I remember we want to keep this one here. So one magnesium, one magnesium, one carbon, one carbon. And then here I'm going to have my three halves or 1.5 to turn two into three because again, I don't want to change this. Similarly, to make my C6H12O6 comes from carbon, which is a solid, not a diatomic. Hydrogen is a diatomic and hydrogen is a gas. And then oxygen is also a diatomic and a gas, C6H12O6, solid. We've got six carbons, 12 hydrogens, we need another six here, six oxygens, so a three there. Okay, so that's how we can write equations for their formation. If I wanted to calculate the enthalpy of formation, well, the change in enthalpy for a given reaction is calculated by subtracting the enthalpies of formation of the reactants from those of the products. So that's where we have our products minus our reactants. Again, these are our enthalpies of formation. This is the formula that's given to us here on our formula sheet. And we can see over here that this is standard enthalpy okay, under those standard conditions. Um, again, elements in their standard state are not included because their heats of formation or enthalpies of formation are zero. Okay. Well, what if we want to calculate the delta H for the combustion of octane? So we've got our octane, burning in oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. We want to know our delta H for it. So for our delta H, I need to look at my heats of formation for each of my compounds. Now, now that we're starting to get into all the different types of thermodynamics 
in the front of your packet is a chart with select thermodynamic data. And we'll see that all of our compounds are listed and it continues on to the next pages here in alphabetical order by element. And then we have our delta H, our delta G and our S. So this is Gibbs free energy, which we'll get to later. This is entropy, which we'll get to later in this video. So we wanna look for on our chart, so we're looking for C8H18. Let's see if we can find that one on here. So it might not be on our chart. That one doesn't look like it is. Carbon dioxide is though. So carbon dioxide, oops, off your screen. We have our delta H negative 393.5. Um, if we look for oxygen, remember oxygen written like this is in its elemental form. And so it's going to be zero. And we can see that here too, in case we forget, oxygen is zero. And then water, H2O, and water up at the top over here, water, H2O, negative 286. So we said water, negative 286, carbon dioxide, gas was negative 393.5, so this was zero. And then if I look up my C8H18 of octane, that wasn't in, wasn't on our chart, but we can easily look them up as well. That's negative 250.1. And all of these have units of kilojoules per mole. Um, let's see, right now this is not balanced. So to balance this, we need a 12 and a half here, an eight and a nine. Ooh, my apologies, it's off the screen. So if I want the heat formation of my reaction, we said that that was the sum of my delta H of my products. And we've got this N in front and that has to do with our number of moles minus N delta H of my reactants. So my products, I've got eight times the negative 393.5 plus nine times negative 286. All of that minus my reactants, negative 250.1, and then that is zero. So eight times, I get a delta H F of my reaction to be negative 5,471.9 and my units are kilojoules per mole. So again, now that we have these charts, we can look up these values and plug in to figure out our heat of formation or standard enthalpies. Well, now let's take a look at entropy. So entropy is different than enthalpy. And that entropy is a measure of the disorder of a system. Okay. So there is chaos growing in the universe all the time at the expense of order, right? It's like your bedrooms and you might organize your bedroom, but eventually your bedroom is going to get a little bit messy and it's going to get messier and messier and messier. And all of a sudden it's going to reach this steady state of messiness. It might get too messy and then come back down to be, you might clean it a little bit, but it's going to get back to this state of messiness. And that's this chaos or disorder that we have. And this chaos that we call entropy is a fundamental principle of science. We give it the state function S for it. And because of the state function, it must always increase for the universe as a whole, although some systems entropy may decrease. So as a universe as a whole, entropy is increasing. But if we look at one tiny little part of it, that one might be decreasing. But overall, throughout the entire universe, it's increasing. Um, for any spontaneous process, which is a chemical reaction that just happens because it's thermodynamically favorable, the entropy of the universe increases. 
So we must include consideration of a system's environment in order to apply this law. So for example, condensing a gas implies a large decrease in the system's entropy. If I'm going from a gas to a liquid, I'm creating more order in my system, and that's a negative delta S because I'm going against creating more chaos. However, fortunately, the latent heat of vaporization gets released to, to force the surroundings to act by high level energies. So my surroundings are now increasing in entropy. And this is more substantial than the amount that was decreasing when I condensed my gas. So overall in my universe, my entropy is increasing. So just important to note that within the universe, I'm always increasing in entropy. And that has to do with the addition of my system and my surroundings added together. Those will always add up to be a number equal or greater than zero because of this property. So some spontaneous and physical and chemical processes. So things like waterfalls run downhill or water runs downhill. Sugar dissolves in coffee. At one atmosphere, water freezes below zero degrees Celsius and melt, ice melts above zero degrees Celsius. Heat flows from hot to cold. Um, a gas expands in the container that it's in until it fills the container. Um, iron exposed to oxygen and water forms rust. So these are all things that happen because their thermodynamics favor them to happen. So we consider them spontaneous. Okay? They're thermodynamically favorable. They just occur because that's what makes sense for them to do. Well, enthalpy that we just talked about is a factor in whether a reaction is spontaneous or not. However, it's not the only factor. An exothermic reaction favors spontaneity or spontaneous reaction since the products are at a lower potential energy, but it doesn't guarantee it. So remember, we can chart that on a potential energy diagram, right? If my products are at a lower energy level than my reactants, that is an exothermic reaction that has a negative delta H. This is favorable because it when it gets to the lowest energy state, but it's not guaranteed that that makes it spontaneous. So we have to be able to determine is my delta S cost for spontaneity, right? Am I increasing in disorder? And then how does that relate to spontaneity in general, which is Gibbs free energy, which we'll talk about in a little bit in the next video or so. So how do we determine if delta S entropy is positive or negative? Well, for any substance, the solid state is more ordered than the liquid state, and the liquid is more ordered than the gas. That makes sense. Entropy often increases when something dissolves in something else. Entropy is also going to increase as temperature increases. That makes sense, too. Things move around faster when temperature increases. Therefore, the amount of disorder is going to increase. Okay. If a reaction produces more gas molecules than it consumes, so I'm creating more molecules than it consumes, I'm going to have a positive delta S. I'm going to increase in entropy. However, if my total number of gas molecules diminishes, I'm going to have a negative delta S. Or I'm going to decrease in my disorder or decrease in my entropy. If there's no net change in the total number of gas molecules, then we don't know for certain. Um, if it'll be positive or negative, but we'll know that it'll be a relatively small number. Okay, so we can't guarantee it, but it'll be relatively small. Entropy increases as the number of moles of gas increases during a chemical reaction, and entropy increases as the complexity of the molecule increases. So if I go from two, uh, you know, if my element, and then I create a new compound that's increasing in complexity. Therefore, I'm increasing in entropy. So let's look at some different examples and determine if our change in entropy is positive or negative. So here in my first one, I have a solid and a gas, okay, both in their elemental forms, creating a new solid. Okay, for this one, I am going from a solid and a gas to just a solid. Gases have way more disorder than solids do. So this is going to have a negative entropy because I'm decreasing in my amount of disorder. In my next one, I'm going from a gas and a gas. So I have one plus three, I have four moles of gas to two moles of gas. Again, I'm decreasing in my moles of gas. So I'm creating more order. So this is a negative 
change in entropy because I'm creating more order, less chaos. Well, let's look at some different processes. Condensing water vapor. So that means I'm going from a gas to a liquid. I'm getting more ordered. So that makes for a decrease in entropy. If I'm forming crystals from a super saturated solution. Well, that means that I am going to make solid, super saturated solution is aqueous. So I'm going from aqueous to a solid. Again, that's creating more order. So that's a decrease in entropy. My next example, I'm heating a gas from 60 to 80. I'm increasing the temperature. That means they're moving around faster. If I'm increasing temperature, moving around faster, that is going to, with an increase in temperature, that is going to increase my disorder because they're moving around more. They're bouncing off the walls. If I'm subliming dry ice, that is going from a solid to a gas, that's an increase in disorder, right? Gases are much more disordered than solids. So that's an increase in my entropy. We have values to these numbers as we saw that we have values in our uh, thermodynamic data chart. And we can calculate the standard entropy of a reaction. So delta S naught is the enthalpy cha entropy change for a reaction carried out at one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius. So this formula is also on our constant sheet. We can see it here. Okay. So what's the standard entropy change for the following reaction at 25 degrees Celsius? Well, let's take a look in our chart to pull out our data. So I want the S, my entropy value, for carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide, CO, I go across. I want entropy, carbon monoxide, 198. And those are in joules per mole kilojoule, mole kelvin. I want to look for oxygen. And now this, for oxygen, O2, we have an entropy. We have a state of disorder. So that's 205. And then carbon dioxide, back to the other page, carbon dioxide as a gas, 214. So we have our delta S is equal to our S of our products minus N times the S of our reactants. So this one's balanced. So my products, 2 times 214 minus 2 times 198 plus 1 times 205. And when I add those up, I get negative 173 units of joules per mole Kelvin. Now I have a negative value here. And I ask myself, does this make sense? Well, if I look at my reaction, I'm going from three moles of gas to two moles of gas. So it does make sense. We have a decrease in disorder because we're going from three moles of gas to two moles of gas. So a negative delta S value makes sense. So how can we determine if a reaction is spontaneous or if it's not spontaneous? Well, if I have delta H, if I'm looking at delta H, and it is a negative value. We say that's an exothermic reaction. That's going to favor a spontaneous reaction. It favors it. Doesn't guarantee, but it favors it. If I have delta H, if delta H is a positive value, That means I'm increasing in disorder. Well, that's also going to favor a spontaneous reaction. Okay. If my temperature 
I can look at if these two conflict. So maybe this is positive. Maybe I have a endothermic reaction and I'm increasing the disorder. Well, then I need to look to temperature. And if temperature can determine if a reaction is spontaneous or not, if I have a high temperature, that's going to favor my spontaneousness. And that's because I have more kinetic energy. Okay. So we want a negative delta H and a positive delta S. I want an exothermic reaction decreasing in energy. I want to increase in disorder. That's going to favor a spontaneous reaction. That is what we want. So we're going to continue to look at this, practice this, analyze our delta H and delta S values tomorrow in class as we continue to practice.